loosen up. <laughs> Welcome to the Zen Meathead Podcast. Boom. Uh, this is Chris and Sarah, and we are here today with our good friend Michael Bradley. Hi. Who we uh, got to know through work originally and yeah. just kind of have adopted you as <laughs> our person. Um, and you have an incredibly interesting and inspiring story. It's all right. Yes. Well, I, dude, I, uh, we're going to like dive deep down because I know you've told me parts of the story here and there. And every time I'm just like, holy fuck. But <laughs> so, yeah, we started out, uh, work together. Um, you were my boss. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was the guy that got yelled at if things went wrong. That's all. Like that's what a boss dude, is. The meat shield. You you came in and you were just like fucking amped and excited. And I always loved working with people like that because it's just like, oh, this guy is super passionate, super easy to get along with. He wants to like grow. Like I love people like you. It makes life so easy. <laughs> yeah, I I didn't know anything, and uh, I was happy for the opportunity to get paid to learn stuff. It never happened before. <laughs> well, dude, it was funny. We were, we were looking for some folks just like we needed like people to come in and put hands on gear. Right. And Yachty hit me up. He was just like, so I got this buddy and he's real ambitious and he's real technical, but he's never really been in this space. I was like, dude, fuck it. Like feel good. Let's give it a shot. And dude, thank you. Oh, yeah. Right, thank was, you. You made my <laughs> life easy, but yeah. So, um, you, you've had an interesting journey when you first, when we started working together, you were doing, and I'm going to sound like such a moron trying to explain this. I'm, I'm going to set the stage and let you speak. Um, I'm going to call it eight bit music. You, sure. uh, were a, a DJ of sorts. What do you producer? Yeah. Producer. I mean, I, I DJ as well, but like, uh, playing out all original stuff. Uh, so it was always your own original stuff. Yeah. Through a, through a game boy specifically. Yeah. So you would take tracks of music from Game Boy games, mash them up together, and you were actually playing it, executing it off of the Game Boys live, were you not? It's close. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there are third-party softwares that get flashed onto game cartridges that you pop into the game console that um, leverage the, the sound chip that's inside of the console as a synthesizer, and yep. then uh, gives you the ability to... to track out the sounds that you're making and um yeah i use a couple of different programs but uh the one that i've become well known for is called nano loop this guy in germany makes it it's, uh i use the version for the game boy advance and um yeah when i when i play it live you you make your sounds you record them into loops you save them in little banks and then to actually perform a song live you have to uh know which banks so you're you're when. yeah basically you're using it as a musical instrument and like yeah playing. but also kind of like a game that if you beat the system then you do a great job and if you don't then whoops yeah that's fair <laughs> have you ever had a screw up on stage oh my god <laughs> <laughs> does the pope wear a funny hat yeah, i mean let's see uh, you're a musician it has to have well happened. and oh, i think yeah. for reasons that we're gonna be covering in detail <laughs> yes <laughs> did you ever like were any of them like bad like you fell on your face and you couldn't even like recover or uh well let's start at the beginning <laughs> all right yes. we're, we're missing some context <laughs> for some folks well so so we <laughs> yeah that's fair so um what we're really diving after today and what really want to talk about is uh the three of us know each other know each other pretty well and we're all into like seeing people succeed like friends whatever like just love seeing people be awesome and kick ass what's even more exciting is when somebody takes a rough and tumble you know whatever causes it and has a a close uh run against death if you will and like a, a few of them a terrible life <laughs> as and, it turns uh, out you have uh spun that shit around 180 degrees so bravo dude yeah thank you so uh yeah let's 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 dive in so you're uh <clears throat> doing music stuff product production work um you performed all over the place as i understand like all over the world in fact seven countries that's what is the what Boa Constructor, is that what you actually... Correct. Yep, so people can go and track you down on Instagram and your music and stuff. Sure. Cool. Um, but uh, that industry oftentimes and that level of creativity oftentimes are spurred by stuff that can get dangerous. Drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Drugs. Let's not mince words, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. <laughs> Drugs. So, like, 
I didn't, you know, I knew you liked to party. Like a lot of the guys we worked with, like we were all pretty open about like, Hey, you get your job done. Like, don't get caught. Don't give a shit. I probably partied a little harder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's get into that. So how did it, I mean, I'm guessing, you know, it started the normal way, just, you know, smoking pot, drinking, maybe tea, getting into a little it's bit a more. It's a gateway drug. Tea? Oh, tea, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought you were talking about testosterone. I was like, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Mighty tea. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I think I was still 15, uh, sophomore in high school. And I don't know, I don't want to an individual on blast, but like just for context, um, the first time that I smoked weed, I was super anti that shit, like forever. I just convinced I didn't need it. Um, I was big into like hardcore music. Um, and there's like a, there's like a scene within that scene. Straight edge. Straight edge. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And um, and and I thought mm -hmm. that was really cool. And so I I was all about it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) When I was like 15, I was like, Oh yeah, dude, to the grave. (laughs) Straight (laughs) edge. And then, um, uh, yeah, I was a good athlete, uh, but I got hurt uh, as a sophomore playing football. And one weekend, I think it was after a game, like on a Friday. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, first off, we're at the lunch table in the morning, and these couple of buddies of mine, they're like the two best athletes in the school, maybe city. Um, they're like, hey, so we going to do that tonight? <laughs> what <laughs> yeah we're gonna, gonna smoke <laughs> and i'm like are you serious <laughs> like you guys you guys do, you guys that? do that and they're like yeah it's fine <laughs> and i'm like well gosh i guess i would be open to the idea like i you know i can't play like uh so shit why not um and i don't know i hopefully nobody does too much background research but <laughs> the, the individual who who like got me um kind of convinced me to do it uh the other two i was like yeah whatever this guy um he he uh, he plays in the major leagues <laughs> oh uh, and yeah went on to he played in the uh, world series as a rookie <laughs> holy shit yeah so our lives ended up taking some pretty different trajectories <laughs> <laughs> sounds like it <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah i don't know um right away uh it was uh, you kind of love it first getting high hot um, is yeah it's fucking awesome for sure it. and it's it's um you know throughout all of my childhood and early adolescence um i was really uncomfortable with myself yeah. um talk to every adolescent that's right. ever existed and, <laughs> and and i i think maybe especially for myself because like even as as a child um i i would kind of display um tendencies of of having bipolar disorder and uh one day I'm happy and everyone's my friends and then I go home and mom, no one likes me. And so, uh, yeah, I always really struggled with like social anxiety specifically. Yep. And, um, I was introduced to this thing that allowed me to, uh, step outside of that. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, I was kind of off to the races. Highly addictive. <laughs> Used as a tool yeah, yeah. to it, ease the pain of adolescence. Life. Yeah. Right. And then uh, you want to talk about easing pain, um, right around the same time, uh, because it was a back and neck injury, um, I started being prescribed. Uh, so they considered it a non-opiate at the time, whereas now they're like, oh, no, it's an opiate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a tramadol. Um, oh, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm. And, you know, it's like one felt good and two felt better and three felt better and five and six and seven and eight felt even better. Um, and so, oh, I, oh, I uh, like... 15 going on 16, I'd start running through my month's prescription, uh, in, you know, a few days, uh, oh. <laughs> you just, just oh, really wow. quick and, and I'd be smoking weed and, um, yeah. Was, so you were all into the, I want to feel real good all the time. Pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. It's, uh, it just, it, it felt like the missing piece, you know, um, I was, I was comfortable. Uh, I felt like I was more myself. Um, I ended up being like really, uh, well liked and popular uh, yeah. as as this kid who uh, got high all the time. <laughs> it like worked out for self rewarding system pretty mm. much. Yeah, until it doesn't. Right, and so, uh, I, you know, kind of snowballed from there. On the same note, though, like um, when we first met, uh, I mean, like I knew you were smoking pot and all that stuff, um, but you never like I never had any inklings that you were off the rails, out of control. Uh, however. 
you know, it wasn't long after I left Microsoft. Uh, there was a car accident, was there not? Or... <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> so, Slow your roll, sister. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, th this crazy little anecdote. Um, I haven't thought about it or seen it in, I mean, so many years on our on our way here from lunch. We drove past that park, um, <laughs> which was uh, the, the building in the back. Uh, was the site of Youth Eastside Services? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which uh, when I was seventeen, familiar. I uh, spent some time. Yeah, I got to go to my first uh, rounds of you know what kind of like outpatient treatment. Mm. Uh, I got arrested and expelled from school. Uh, oh, I had, I, so you, oh, <laughs> wow. as a junior, uh, I had some weed in my car. Um, they they reinstated me, but like you know, I was out for a month, um, and I had to go through all that and. Yeah, at this point, you know, 17, uh, within that year, it went from, oh, I don't know. I was a daily user maybe a couple months after first trying it, but, like, it was, like, a serious thing by then. And, um, I remember I got in trouble the day after 420. <laughs> well, at least you got your 420. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. Because um, the night Priorities. before. Yeah. Night, <laughs> night before, my friend and I smoked a lot in my car, you know, celebrating. And then I showed up a little late to school. And, um Walk past the vice principal and he sent people to check on me and whatever the fuck and blah, blah, blah. I get in trouble. But uh, when I <clears throat> was first checked into YES, they give you a drug test and uh, check your levels and everything. And they told me uh, when I came back the next day or something like, wow, you you scored the absolute highest on the THC scale that we've ever seen in <laughs> all of our time being. And I was like, Ooh. hell yeah. <laughs> That's that right, Seth I did, Rogan? baby. <laughs> this is a challenge. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, so, I don't know. I was pretty proud of that. Um, <laughs> I was. James Franco. <laughs> yeah. Seth Rogen. Uh, throw down. I mean, shit. I got, I got uh, expelled again as a senior. Um, this time, because they took drug dogs through the school Oops. and um, I didn't have anything, but they flagged my backpack and I was like, that makes sense. There's probably been a <laughs> in there before and you know, whatever. Um, and then they're like, well, we need to search your car. It's on school property. I say, that's fine. Uh, shit. Turns out uh, a pocket knife is shit. And mm -hmm, you got uh, in trouble for having a pocket knife? In I, I got walked out of uh, the front of the school crying school property, in yeah. front of everyone uh, and charged with carrying a deadly weapon on school campus the same way that somebody with a loaded gun in the classroom would have been. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. That seems a, a little extreme. A it was very extreme. Your car. That's right. Why do you have a weapon with you at school? I go, well, one, I don't really think it's a weapon. He's like, what have you used it for? I think I opened some Christmas presents. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, okay. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, but why is it at school? I go, it's not at school, man. It's something that I keep in my car. It's like a, it's a tool. It's a tool. It's a safety thing. And he's like, no, that's not true. Like you have a weapon at school. Like, why do you have a knife? And I said, I, my grandpa said every good man has a knife. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the teachers started cracking up and I, I didn't even realize I was going to get in trouble until they were like, yeah, you're in trouble. And uh, so that kind of sucked. Wow. It's like of all of the things you could get in trouble for, of all of the things that I've done over the years, get yeah. in trouble for that. I mean, it was like, it, right. I was uh, pretty um, butthurt about it at the yeah, time, but yeah. at the same time, it was like impotent old farts <laughs> with, with, with everything it. that I've been doing. Um, <laughs> it was bound to happen right. one way or another. It just sucked that it happened like that. Uh, yeah. Fun, dude. So I, then. Did they actually stick you with the expulsion that time? Uh, no, I got back in again. Oh, all right. yeah, which was nice. I was able to graduate. It was hard though, so I don't know. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> so then you kind of just like kept with the uh, the same ways, just kept having a good time, partying. Yeah, I mean, at this point, I was already using uh, harder drugs. You know, it wasn't just drinking and smoking anymore, and. Um, how it's, was that transition? Uh, it's pretty, pretty natural, <laughs> pretty gradual. It's, um, I, I just, uh, I got in with the kids that would, uh, sell weed and then we start selling Coke and we start selling ecstasy and I, yeah, hmm. I, I, I partook uh, <laughs> pretty <laughs> regularly and, uh, you know, he used psychedelics and, um, kind of, I remember though, the first time that I used something that I considered a hard drug, I was in the shower uh, and I was like, I told myself I was never going to do this. But, okay, now I just need to be able to draw the line somewhere. Um, I'm never going to 
smoke meth or crack or do PCP uh, or heroin. Um, and I think if I can keep it to that, I'll be chilling. Well, <laughs> none of those stuck. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you crossed off the full gambit. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, it's important to get the full set. It's like Pokemon, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure if it's quite like Pokemon. <laughs> it's a little scarier. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, like, it's interesting to think about having that conversation with yourself of like, how far is too far? How far am I willing to take this? Um, and that was kind of where I was headed with that question. Um, so, yeah, just like, where do you draw the line? And I'm a that's, Wiskins. That's, that's, yeah, kind of the... Well, and the problem is the way that you're explaining it to me, it sounds a lot like me drinking and smoking pot where it's like, um, I was such a consistent user for so long. Um, my tolerance was super high. Um, so to a lot of outside folks, I think they were pretty put off by how much I can see, but it was like, but then, yeah, it was like starting to be like, huh, well, what else is there to explore out there? Mm. Yep. Um, uh, call it morbid curiosity or whatever. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I just, uh, I, I quickly established myself as somebody who could, um, hold myself together while going a lot harder than my peers. And, yeah. um, I was proud of that as Badge well. Badge of honor. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. And so I, I just kept pushing it. <laughs> it's funny. I, uh, I used to think that way about my pain tolerance. I have a ridiculously high pain tolerance. And then I Me sat too. and thought about it and I went, wait, so that's actually because I've desensitized my body over the course of my life so much that I can withstand more pain before it affects me. That's not good. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> that's, that's, that's an interesting response to a really shitty situation. Yeah, I don't know. So. That's useful at least. No, that's true. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. How do I... You you, you mentioned that uh, I... It wasn't too obvious um, when yeah. we first started working I mean, together. I mean, every, all those guys, like most of the folks on that team were having a good time. But again, like we we got shit done. So I was like, do what you do. Yeah, I held it together super well for a super long time. Um, and, you know, uh, I don't even know. Like, how much do I fast forward through? Uh, I went to <laughs> I went to uh, inpatient treatment the first time when I was like 23, 30 now. Um, and... Uh, I was not doing well. Like, um, after I dropped out of college a couple of times by the time I was 19 or 20, um, I, music was going okay for me. You know, I was kind of starting to, um, take it seriously and I, I booked a tour for myself and, um, ran out of money while on the tour. And, um, turns out that my grandpa lived in St. Louis and, uh, he was like, yeah, you can stay with me. And, um, uh, he owned a music store. So he's like, you can work here through the summer. And I was like, great. And then I didn't want to go home. Um, yeah. I mean, to touch upon things that continued to lead me to try to escape from reality. Um, my, my home life was like on the outside. I'm sure it looked cool. Um, I, I grew up with wealth, but, mm -hmm. um, parents who hated each other and couldn't uh, like, uh, effectively communicate with, anybody um, Gross. right and so they had finally gotten divorced at that point and uh, it was pretty messy and I didn't want to be around for it so I stuck around out there and then I moved to Detroit and uh, spent a year out there came back and by the time I was living in the Midwest I was drinking like really regularly um, throughout the day um, yeah. and uh, I just I was doing real poorly like I I'd ruined my car I wasn't taking care of it um, and I was, my mental health was, um, really not good. And so my parents kind of faced me with the opportunity, um, via doctor's recommendation, um, to, you know, go to treatment and they say, if you can do that and you can stay sober, we'll, um, we'll let you go to school again and we'll, we'll pay for a place for you to live. And I thought, yeah, it sounds pretty cool. Oh yeah. New car as well. Sure. Let's, let's go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but while being there, um, they, they go pretty hard on preaching, um, the concepts of the Alcoholics Anonymous program, yep. which is basically, which is basically that, um, you, you don't just have a problem with what it is that you're here for. You have a problem with substances and, um, it's kind of like, a uh, 
a, a mental and emotional issue more so than um, just your physical dependency physical addiction on the uh, chemicals, whatever that you're substance, using. right? And um, I wasn't convinced. I was like, yeah, I drink too much, and I I shouldn't drink too much, and you know, using hard drugs uh, isn't good. I acknowledge that, but like. I can't write music unless I'm smoking weed and uh, I can't do well unless I've got some stimulants in my system. And um, so I was like, yeah, I'll play along while I'm here and probably try to keep it cool. Uh, but this isn't my gig. Long it's time. not my thing. You know, I, I feel bad for those who this is their thing and they have to be kept uh, on such a tight leash, but not me. And uh it turns out it was me. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. It turns and, out it was. Yeah. And then I guess for context, like uh, looking back and, and being an active part of that program now, um, going and kind of sharing my story with people who are um, actively inside of uh, treatment um, facilities, uh, they put pretty big focus on like um, things that you give up uh, along the way to um, cater to towards your addiction and uh, for me I think I only lasted a month after I got out of treatment that first time and had a place to live and I had a car and I was going to school for something that I actually cared about music production and uh, audio engineering and uh, I was great uh, but then I was using again and uh, yeah how do I, I I always say it like when I decided to to break the no drinking thing. I was like, you know what? There's this really good seasonal beer that I like and it's the season and I'm going to call the bottle shop and see if they've got it in stock. And I'm just going to keep it to the weekends and it's going to be real cool. And I think two weeks later, I was probably digging for coins in my couch cushions to go buy a fucking four loco at the gas station. Mm. You know, it's just really quick. Damn. Um, yeah. But uh, that that went on to become, oh, OK, you dropped out of school. You're you're not sober. Uh, you have to pay for where you're living. I go, okay, well, I can't afford it. I have a friend come move in. Um, I was going on another tour and I was going to have him cover the larger part of rent while I was gone for a month. And then he goes, Oh, actually I had a friend just move up here and, uh, we are, uh, <laughs> we're going to get a house. So I'm, I'm not going to do that. And I was like, well, what the fuck? And oh. he goes, well, you can move in with us. And I said, Hmm. Uh, okay. So decided I was going to do that when I moved back. Um, we, I made the choice <laughs> to move into uh, a literal murder mansion um, in Rainier Beach at like 23 years old. Yeah. Um, murder murder mansion. mansion. Yeah. I want to hear more about uh -huh. it. what is um, <laughs> So uh, kind of a, you know, bigger house in Rainier Beach and um, not well kept in the slightest. And the, the owner told us she was going to like clean it out before we moved in and she didn't. And, um, Oh, there's just black mold all over oh. everything. Um, we would, we would, as time went on, we would find like knives and um, crack pipes and, uh, you know, burnt spoons and all that good stuff kind of strewn about the house. And then we would see some suspicious red stains like in the kitchen or uh, there's like this real spooky basement that had a bunch of trash and rats in it at this place. And, uh, <laughs> Coming up the stairs to the main floor of the house, uh, we there were kind of some like reddish brown hand printy streaks uh, along the wall, and we were like, "That's pretty weird." And oh, not to mention a lock at the top uh, to to where you can't get out. Yeah, lock you in. <laughs> uh huh. And that was weird. And so. Uh, in the living room, there was like a day bed and one day we're like, fuck this. She's never going to come move stuff out. We're just going to go toss it in the, uh, basement. And we took the mattress off the day bed and like the slats below it. And they're probably three, two by fours soaked through with blood. And, I mean, not fresh, obviously, but like, uh, very apparent there's, there's no way that that much blood, uh, was lost and somebody lived. Yikes. Um, yeah, and we were pretty uncomfortable about it, but also like um, actively engaging in um, uh, illegal activities every day. And so we're like, <laughs> can't call the cops. I'm probably not going to bring the police into this. And so we just ignored Jeez. it. <laughs> and we continued to live there for, I don't know, um, six months. Uh, yeah, there's no heat. 
Um, it, maybe it would have worked, but the vents were all filled with black mold and I wasn't comfortable uh, turning those on. So I would uh, just wear a jacket inside. And, you know, I went from having everything kind of lined up really nicely for me to succeed uh, to choosing um, getting high and drinking and Fuck it all living up. in a real scary place. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah. without that, you wouldn't be where you are now. Oh, uh, correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that, that was, that was before I started working um, with you. And uh, by the time that I'd started working with you, we moved to a different spot uh, in Skyway, which was not a murder mansion. It was, it was a big step, a big upgrade. <laughs> yeah. Big upgrade. Yeah. Uh, Anytime I live in a house that doesn't have murder in the name, I feel, I feel like I'm It seems like a it. pretty reasonable request. Yeah. 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 You know, I, yeah, I, I like it now. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. God. Um, so I don't know. Things continued to, um, pick up and yeah, right. We're talking about, I was a pretty active part of like a party scene. Um, and so, Drug use was a real regular thing um, as I was going to clubs every other night and stuff. And um, basically, I I wasn't doing super well for myself, but I held it together long enough um, until COVID hit. And uh, I was already in a bad relationship. And um, we were both... Uh, so let's see. I had already like totaled my car... Um, prior to COVID happening because mm -hmm. I came back from a, a work Christmas party uh, where I was drinking on a lot of Xanax and yeah, Xanax was um, up there as maybe my gnarliest addiction. Um, and, you know, kind of blacking out periodically behind the wheel and I slammed into a, a, a barrier on a on ramp or whatever. And so whatever yeah you know <laughs> nothing major no big deal tuesday night <laughs> uh but like so i didn't have a car and i had my own place that i was living but um the girl i was with uh was um really unwell and um i had some serious trust issues and um so she wasn't comfortable letting me go home despite you know not displaying any kind of behavior to be alarming or um so we were both stuck working from home uh, together and to kind of like get through the days we were using a lot of coke um, to, you know, stay on top of what ended up being even heavier workloads than when we were capable of going into the office and stuff. And yep. uh, at this point, I was managing a team of 10. <laughs> and, oh, shit. Uh -huh, and I would wake up in the morning and start drinking hard alcohol. And I'd, I'd usually finish a bottle by lunchtime, noon or 1 p.m., um, Maybe take a nap, maybe uh, have enough stimulants to stay awake through it. Um, I was always on Xanax. Uh, and things in that relationship, you know, just got even worse. And so you were basically just trying to mute all the bullshit in your world through substance. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I was working okay, I guess. But um, things in the relationship got even worse. And uh, this girl was trying to kill herself and um eventually kind of had to come to a stop and so it's like okay i am going back to the place that i pay rent for with my roommate and within um two or three weeks of me being back once i'd kind of already gotten to this point um where like opiate use was um a pretty active thing for me again um my roommate was like hey i'm getting laid off uh from my job and i can't stick around to be here to see you like this. And so I'm going to, I'm going to leave. And, um, I was doing real well, making about six figures and, uh, with e even paying his portion of the rent, it would have been fine had I not been spending like $3,000 a month on drugs and alcohol. But, but I was, uh, yeah. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I ended up having to move back in with my mom with like this great job and stuff. And, um, opiate use got a lot worse. Uh, I, yeah, I had my first overdose. It was like a week before Christmas when my little sister was back from college and uh, she found me, you know, choking. Oh. And, yeah. Uh, so upon being uh, resuscitated, uh, I, I vomited and I inhaled it. So I aspirated. Uh, and uh, that left me with some like really severe pneumonia. Um, so I was in the ICU for five days um, with pneumonia forcibly detoxing off of um everything e of everything and um to the point where uh oh god 
I'll never forget when I, when I came to, uh, after being there and being in the bed, I had a ventilator in cause I didn't have enough oxygen in my blood and you're never supposed to be awake when you have a ventilator in. it's, it's terrible. It's torture. Um, and my feet and arms were like cuffed into the Locked bed. Uh, not that I was in trouble, but like they don't want you to be able to move around yeah. to dislodge the ventilator tubes. And I was kind of like freaking out cause it's really uncomfortable to yeah. be awake for. And so I'm kind of like, readjusting my throat and like coughing it out and stuff. And, um, to the point where it gets just dislodged enough that it felt like I was choking actively. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is, this is horrible. I need to get someone's attention. Is there like a button or something I can nope because I can't move my hands. And, um, uh, it took, it took probably 45 minutes, uh, of, of me being stuck in this situation where I'm thrashing and trying to get somebody's, uh, attention, um, feeling like I was, uh, like drowning the entire time. Oh, that's um, awful. Yeah. And, uh, 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 you know, whatever got through it. And, uh, upon getting out and sharing the experience with my using buddies, I'll call them. Um, they're like, Oh man, you really goofed up. It's because you, uh, you snorted the fentanyl. You're not supposed to do that. You're just supposed to smoke it. And cause then you just nod off. Whereas you, you know, went over the edge and I was like, Oh, okay. So a good couple, tip, buddy. Yeah. A cu- couple weeks <laughs> after a yeah, couple weeks after getting out, uh, I decided I was going to smoke something with a friend again. And I took one hit off the same pill that he was smoking and, uh, killed me. I had to be brought back to life and um, you technically whoa. died yeah i was dead for a bit um and you want to talk about like people talk about uh, i don't know seeing a light or having their life flash before their eyes or you know some kind of profound significant um occurrence being dying or being near death none of that <laughs> i was just asleep all of a sudden with with no dreams and then i woke up in a hospital bed. Um, Maybe that was the message. You know, you're not done here yet. You don't get to see the light. <sighs> yeah, I think that might be something uh, about it, but like it just... Um, or maybe you just haven't lived a life enough to flash before your eyes yet. Maybe. Um, so, something to aspire to. Uh huh. <clears throat> but upon waking up, I was like, where the fuck am I? Oh, no, I know what's going on here. This this has happened before now. And uh, <laughs> Oh, we're here again. <laughs> yeah, the, the doctor comes in. And she goes, oh, wow, you're awake. That's great. And I go, yeah, what time is it? She's like, what? I go, yeah, what? can you tell me what time it is? She goes, uh, it's 6.30 in the morning. And I was like, okay, I can be discharged, right? And she's like, what do you mean? Like, you were just dead. Like, we should have like a talk and stuff. And I was like, yeah, that's great. I need to get to work. <laughs> Um, cause I wasn't scared of dying. I was scared of not being able to afford to continue getting high. Um, yeah. that was kind of damn. It. Yeah. And, uh, after that one, I did manage to stop using opiates, but only opiates. So it's, it's fascinating to me. Um, I know we talked about this once before. I didn't realize, you know, fentanyl people are just kind of starting to hear about, uh, mainstream cause obviously they're cutting a lot of drugs with it and kids specifically are dying, which is fucking horrible and your arms cramping again <laughs> like a bitch um i'd never heard of people intentionally using fentanyl um i just thought it was a cutting agent because i know a teeny little dose can do you in so you were like doing the math or just gambling <laughs> oh that's a gamble i didn't i didn't care <laughs> so here's some i'll take that i yeah. just just wanted to escape you know um and uh yeah they press it into fake Percocet pills. Um, and it's, uh, it's a really big problem now. And most users at this point are actively, uh, deliberately seeking out fentanyl. Yeah. Jesus. I mean, I know, I know it's the cheap option, but like, well, and it's coming in way closer to our circle than it ever has before. Yeah. Wow. Like I think, you know, so many people that, that you're starting to hear about that kind of stuff happening to you. are just like, holy shit. Like, it's an epidemic. It's sad and it's yeah. scary. And like kids who have never even tried anything, taken real Vicodin are, are getting into smoking fentanyl. Like a, a lot of kids I, I personally know. Again, seeking out fentanyl intentionally. Yep. Wow. 
Yeah. And so, you know, I don't know. It's like playing Russian roulette, dude, and then loading half the chamber. Yeah, it's spooky. Um, but I guess if you're in that, you know, mental state where it's like. The kids just don't know any better, you know. But uh, whereas for me, I think I was overdosing so easily because I was also taking lots of Xanax uh, at the same time and drinking. And so my everything was kind of suppressed. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know. I kept going for another six months after that second overdose. Um, and things would continue to get a lot worse. Like at this point I had also picked up a, uh, a nitrous habit. Um, I was doing like 50, hundred whippets a day, like through the work day. Um, just drinking, uh, smoking DMT. Wow. Dude, like just <laughs> DMT. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just I, escapism, like I, at its finest. It blows my mind, though, like having, like I said, I guess it wasn't nearly as escalated when we were working together, but it's like, dude, you were Johnny on the spot, fucking happy, great mindset, motivated others, like getting shit done, staying late. I was just like, dude, this guy's a fucking dream. And wow, to have it like right there and not even. Yeah, I mean, <sighs> think, things got a lot worse before they, yeah. uh, you know, had to get better, but um to fast forward to kind of the end of it, uh, I'd finally been demoted at work. And so a guy that I had been managing had become my manager and, oh, I felt real sorry for myself and, um, didn't come to work for a couple of days. I was just sleeping. Um, and upon going back, my new manager was like, Hey, I have this, uh, camping spot I reserved a long time ago, but I can't use it. Why don't you, why don't you go take this? And I go, yeah, sure. <clears throat> I got off work early on Friday so that I could get out there at a, at a good hour. Instead, I uh, just drank and then probably didn't leave till maybe like 10 PM. Um, and on the drive, I was, uh, freebasing cocaine and I was, uh, I hadn't slept the night before. I was slept doing Coke all night and it's, uh, yeah, doing the whippets and drinking vodka and I always like kind of leave out the weed stuff because there's just such a it's, it's kind of anticlimactic at the end of it. Yeah. And I was smoking a cigarette. And weed. Yeah. Um, I had a Snickers bar as well. I used right. some eye drops by Zine. Yeah. And so I don't know. Eventually uh I like fell asleep at the wheel doing something like 80 and rolled my car six times. And um I was like fine. At least yeah. you were relaxed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did you just like totally just walk away from that one or? Yeah. I just had some scrapes on my arms from the, all the broken glass. Um, Jeez. And I didn't even get a DUI. And <laughs> uh, they're like, okay, so you can sit out here in the middle of nowhere and wait for someone to come pick you up or you can get in the ambulance. And I go, yeah, sure. I'll take the ambulance and uh, made it to a uh, Lake Chelan where they had their little ER and uh, almost got into like a fist fight with the, the doctor there because he was being mean. That's how it uh, goes well. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. And I was like screaming at him and uh, he's like, get out. And I was like, good, I want to. Uh, and cause he was like, oh yeah, this guy has this, that, 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 that in his system. And he was driving and I just hate people like you who are risking the lives of others. And I was like, Hey man, fuck you. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> yeah. And any uh, other time in my life, I would agree with you. There's right. you got a valid point. <laughs> but, you, it's not the right time, bud. Right. Read the room. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> but to the point where they're like, okay, now, um, your car is somewhere around Wenatchee get on the bus and go back there. You can go get a rental or a U-Haul or whatever, get all your stuff out of your car. I was practically living out of it, even though I had my own apartment and stuff. Um, and, uh, but my Xanax was still in the car and going back to that kind of issue with anxiety that I've always had. Um, when you're abusing benzos, uh, to, to, to help you cope with anxiety, your anxiety is just going to get a lot worse, like a lot, lot worse to the point where, I was stuck out there for a few days and I uh, had a mental breakdown and had to have my, my dad and stepmom kind of come intervene and uh, upon being picked up and taken to the car and seeing the wreckage and everything, my dad's like, listen, I, uh, I don't know what to do for you. I can't really help you. Um, I can't relate to this. I've tried. Uh, but, uh, our family friend who's been a part of your life, since you've been alive, who's been sober since you've been alive has kind of been through some stuff like this. Oh, and he just so happens to live in Wenatchee. So why don't we go see him right now? And, uh, so I had to sit down and he kind of broke it down and was like, listen, you might not care, uh, whether you live or die in this moment, but, um, 
I think if you had some time to, you know, um, clear your mind and, uh, kind of detoxify, um, you'll come to recognize that, uh, there are a lot of people who love you and, um, would like to see you do well. Uh, and yeah. you, you know, there's this really good place over here in Yakima that, uh, you should go to. And I was reluctant. Um, but, uh, I was talked into it and, you know, so I go, okay, hop on the phone, take your little, uh, induction interview thing and, and we'll see, uh, about getting you in there. And I go, okay. Uh, and in my mind, I'm like, okay, no big deal. I still have a bunch of drugs in the car. I can, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll be able to go home for a little bit and, and chill out and have some fun before I end up having to go here. And <laughs> Because like, yeah, no. <laughs> no, norm, normally when you get a bed date, it's at least a few days out uh, for treatment. And they're like, yeah, cool. How does 9 a.m. tomorrow sound? And I'm like, not great. And they go, well, that's when you're going to come. And I say, OK. And my dad's like, well, let's see. You don't have anything with you, so we can take you home uh, to pack a bag and then drive you back out here. Or maybe you could just stay the night at your grandma's house who lives here in Yakima and we'll just get there first thing. I was like, yeah, take me home. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to do that. And my stepmom's just like, no fucking way. And and I was real upset about it at the Smart time. Smart woman. Oh, yeah. I she mean, knew what you were up prob to. Probably saved my life in the long run. Um, and uh, yeah, I went to treatment and I couldn't like look anyone in the eye or like talk too much for like the first week. And uh upon being able to kind of think straight again, um, I, I kind of, uh, I, I tell my story, uh, to, to other folks there who, um, uh, about how I landed in there and, uh, they're pretty much everyone would be like, wow, dude, God loves you. And I was like, I don't know about that. <laughs> what's, what's this all about? But as, as like more and more people kind of kept responding with that, when I told them about my story, I was like, Maybe there's something to this. Um, you know, I don't I don't know what I'm here for and I don't know. Um, but I don't know if I'll ever know what it is, but I, I definitely know in this moment that it's not to keep um, hurting my loved ones. Destroying yourself. Right. And yeah. um, just kind of ran with it. And they give you a lot of suggestions while you're in there. And uh, I just took all of them and got super involved in this. 12 step program and, um, and you're still doing it today. Yeah. And, uh, next month I'll have two years sober. Two awesome. years. So, so was there like another one of those conversations like at that breaking point where you were like, okay, I'm done. Like, this is it. I'm buying in I'm uh, investing, throwing all my chips in. I think it was pretty gradual by the time that I had gotten to treatment, but like, um, all, all the stuff that I heard the first time about like, you can't, you can't mess with any of this stuff, man. You know, you have a problem with substances and, um, all oh. right. And treating them as your solution. Um, and I was just kind of like, yeah, they're right. <laughs> Maybe I'll just fucking, uh, play nice. And yeah. So I did. How was that transition? Cause I mean, you know, obviously, uh, if you're tangled in that deeply, a treatment center seems like a nice way to step out um but force the issue but still like e such a fucking crazy lifestyle transformation where you've you have all this emotional trauma and drama in the background that you're trying to mute uh through substances and now all of a sudden like whammo it's all fucking here you have no crutches anymore like it's time to face this shit like well that had to be really overwhelming and you took a, a next step further and you didn't just clean up your drug problem and your substance problem you cleaned up all of this yeah dude that took, that took a little longer than uh, well yeah but <laughs> the initial it's, sobriety yeah it in a perfect world it all comes together in synchronicity right right and if we're gonna be real real corny we'll call it on god's time or something something like that <laughs> yeah you get it when you get it and not a second before you get that's it that's right uh <laughs> it's yeah i'm i'm uh i'm convinced that um I, I'm not always going to get what I want, but I'll definitely always get what I need. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I don't know. There's a word, a word that talks about believing in, you know, what the universe has for you. What is that word, honey? Is it, is it fuck you? <laughs> it, <laughs> starts, it starts with the same, the same letter. Uh, what, what is it? That's it, 
the word is faith. There is you what go. you're looking for. So. Yes. Oh yeah, I have some of that now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I've been like really really fighting and struggling with that, but yeah, it's it's an interesting, um, especially I, I, if I recall correctly as well. You kind of grew up like fairly atheist. Yeah, yeah, I, I did as well. Like to the point of having some negative opinions about folks that were religious, and it's only been in the last few years where I'm like, you, I know, we're crazy, right? <laughs> Um, recognizing and it's like, I may not use the same terminology and all that, but for the most part, like what you guys are preaching is like generally pretty good stuff. Like universal principles, yeah. if you will. Take sure. the business out of it and the rest of it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. I remember um, my parents wanted to raise me semi-religiously and um, so I'd go to like vacation Bible school and uh I remember I went to one when I was probably 12 or 13 and one of the kids asked the counselor like, Hey, what's going to happen to my Jewish friends? And the counselor's like, well, they're going to go to hell. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yep. And I was just like, fuck this. Uh-uh. <laughs> yeah. I have some really nice Jewish friends yeah. and any, yeah. anything that believes that they're going to go to hell uh, for their difference in belief is not something that I can get down with. Yeah. No, I was, I went to a, a Jesuit university and in one of our fundamental religion classes got into it with the priest who was teaching it and said, you know, like if there was an Island in the middle of the ocean that had never been touched by humanity outside of the population that lives there. And they live to the tenets of their faith, much to the same as Catholicism does, or, you know, um, and yet they've never had the opportunity to be exposed to anything else, but they, they live the same way. Uh, You're like, you're saying they're going to hell. And he was like, absolutely. Like, uh, I'm out. You lost me. You totally lost me. (laughs) Yeah. That's yeah. Maybe the one thing that actually stuck with me from my semester at a university was I was taking world history. Uh, the professor started to break down uh, how organized religion came about, and it's yeah. like, wait a minute. So you're saying each individual landlocked region had their own religion, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and the only reason why there's different ones is because they were incapable of communicating with one another and traveling at the time. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> It's quite the interesting little piece there. Yeah, wow. And, and it helps you to control the masses. That's weird. Yeah. Even stranger. Yeah. <laughs> and yet so many of the principles tend to like the good parts of it, at least tend to yeah. like fluidly wrap through all of them. The yeah. second you try and convince me that your option is the only option. Yeah. You've lost me. I'm out. Yep. It's so arrogant. Yeah. And I, I mean, to take it a step further, uh, back when I used to be pretty anti-religious, um, I, I kind of, I'd take like a moral high ground and be like, listen, if you need some fucking book and some cornball who's cheating on his wife, preaching to all of you to tell you, um, how to be good, people. how to be a good person, man, fuck you. <laughs> yeah. I, I got no time for you. Whereas today, um, yeah, I'm certainly more open-minded and mm-hmm. uh, as a big part of getting involved in a 12 step program, you have to kind of establish a relationship with a higher power, which I'm really comfortable with now. Um, but like, uh, I, if somebody needs that to be a good person, I'm, I'm glad it's there. Well, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and to some extent, True. I think that people use it as a crutch, I guess, so they can kind of go on autopilot. Like you have your guidelines, you know where you're supposed to be. And as long as you follow what they tell you to do, you can just kind of like check out and go along. I, I can you, see some. You all good? What's Dude, happening? Are you just cramping like yeah, spasms? <laughs> fucking crazy. <laughs> oh my goodness. You just wrecked yourself. Well, that's, that's. Uh, this is what three hours a day at the gym looks like. Yeah, kids. I guess so. Yeah. Like last time we saw you, I guess, you know, obviously the audience doesn't know that, but you know, you went from uh, a, a, uh, chubby happy little barrel to like a wall <laughs> of meat dude you, you uh, say the sweetest thing <laughs> you were happy you little were, barrel you were trending in a unhealthy direction bodily uh-huh. um <laughs> i didn't know about the internal damage that was going on i was just watching oh, yeah. you gain weight pretty consistently mm-hmm. um and then yeah you uh you found solace in the gym it appears a hundred percent yeah it's um like you know, priorities are bound to change, uh, when you're going through such a, uh, radical change in your lifestyle. Just, um, you know, I, I was a daily user by the time I was 16, all the way up until I cleaned up at 28. So, um, you know, that's already a really big change. And then it kind of turns out getting the, um, you know, I, I think 
people will uh, refer to like wellness um, in like three categories. Like there's three sides to the triangle, which is like mental well-being, uh, physical well-being, and spiritual well-being. Yep. Um, and I was doing pretty well uh, spiritually, you know, like actually spending a lot of time in meditation and um, in prayer, uh, praying to, you know, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> just Whoever you want to call yourself. Yeah, for sure. And like Not uh, my problem. <laughs> t- taking on... Um, Hey, you. <laughs> a role of like, um, you know, not selfish prayer, um, praying that you can kind of be at your best so that, um, when somebody needs something, you can help be there for them. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, doing all that, uh, I was doing okay. My mental health, um, that's, it's been a big part of the, the story, you know, and, and, um, it wasn't so great initially, you know, it's kind of rewiring my shit and, um, coming to find that the the bipolar tendencies were just bipolar disorder uh, as I no longer was able to uh, ingest something to change the way that I was feeling at will. Um, so it was hard. Um, and I started taking care of some of that stuff with doctors more so than I had in the past. Um, but like, I, yeah, you want to know it's crazy. Uh, what got me into the gym was I had met this kid uh, at an AA meeting. Um, I call him a kid. He's probably 24 now. Um, he uh, he came in. He's real strung out. Uh, he just shot up uh, cocaine. Um, I didn't know people outside. shot up cocaine. Uh, that's that's hardcore. The, the stimulant experience. I, <laughs> I've never done it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I uh, he comes in and he's doing real poorly um but he's he's shredded you know he's like a bodybuilder and um he goes you know we get to know each other and i take him out to eat afterwards and he's like yeah i i work at uh la fitness uh doing sales um so like if you want to um sign up you know like i can help you out and in my mind i'm like here's an opportunity that i can get involved with this guy who needs help um via going to the gym with him and whatever the hell, maybe I can drag him to some more meetings. Yeah. I'll sign up and I'll start doing that. And, um, that didn't pan out with him. Um, but, but the habit, uh, mm-hmm. stuck, stuck. And you broke uh, up with him, but you're still going steady with the gym. Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> um, to the point where yeah, I'm actually really worried for him, um, which yeah. is unfortunate, but, um, well, let's put some good stuff out into the atmosphere yeah. for him. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yo, Kai, <laughs> quit smoking fentanyl. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, just stop. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I don't know. And uh, as as the, the physical stuff kind of started lining up, um, the mental stuff got so much better. Like so, so, so much better. Yeah. And, um, I'm like I'm like one full year into. Um, being physically active again in my life uh, pretty much since, I don't know, I had like a six month stretch in 2018 where I was doing a lot of cardio, but um, this is different compared to when I was still an athlete in high school. Um, this is life. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not, it's, real it's now. not a, it's not an exercise, right. I guess. Yeah. It's um, being about a year in uh, and like really taking care of myself um, particularly in the physical and mental capacities, uh, I have this newfound sense of uh, self-confidence that I, I never imagined was um, a possibility it's for really me fun. in my life. Yeah, and it's um, it's cool too because uh, it's come paired with uh, the mm, humbleness and humility yeah. that um, are kind of preached at you in a 12-step program. Mm-hmm. Um to the point where instead of being some full of myself asshole, um, I, I you're just, just cool. I just feel good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I work hard. I yeah. like it. You're cool with yourself and you're cool with other people and you're Absolutely. cool with what's going on and you can handle anything. And so it's, yeah, it's just cool. I love that energy. Yeah. It's been tight. Wow. Yeah. I'm not scared of girls anymore. <laughs> Turns that- out we're not that mean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, actually, no, well, I take that back. Some of them really are. <laughs> when did you figure out that anxiety? Like, because obviously it sounds like your whole journey spawned off from probably some undiagnosed clinical, like, yeah, like, why am I forgetting the term right now? Uh, bipolar. Neuro- there we go. <laughs> bipolar. Um, potentially a bipolar disorder. Um, so you just started self-medicating and then, you know, it, 
huh. some mental stuff got it. I know it seems like there's a weird correlation, huh? <laughs> Self-diagnosis. Um, all I'm doing is making noises. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, now I'm totally forgetting where the hell I was going with that. I had a valid point. Self-diagnosis. Self-diagnosis. Yes. Self-medication. Um, was there anything else in your life? Cause like I said, potentially, uh, that injury, um, derailing you from sports in high school and then you know your parents kind of melting down in front of you kind of set you on a path that you know was going to be pretty easy to slip off of quite frankly Uh um and it seems like a lot of people don't ever recover from yeah unfortunately what do you think made the difference for you what do you think is the defining thing that makes you successful and maybe helps other people not be successful hmm uh, willingness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, being willing to be uncomfortable and change. Um, that's once again, uh, kind of at the core of a 12 step program as, uh, you don't have to have it all figured out right mm-hmm. in the door, but uh, you have to be willing to try show yeah. up and, and try. try and make each step better than the last. Right. right. And, um, you know, I've, I've worked through the 12 steps. Um, I'm a sponsor, uh, I take other men through the steps. Um, uh, yeah, just being willing to like grow uh, in every capacity of my life. Nice. It's fucking awesome, man. It's uh, <laughs> really glad you didn't do yourself in. That would have uh, that would have been a bummer, man. Yeah, yeah, oh. I, I guess <laughs> <laughs> would have been for me. Speaking from experience, that. yes, <laughs> yeah, it would be a bummer. Yeah. Well, cool. So, music uh, is one last thing I wanted to touch on. So, uh, you know, you mentioned that a lot of creativity came with a lot of these substances. Um, How is that infected? affected it now like are you still um there have been some brief moments where i've i've kind of picked stuff back up i I get booked for a cool show since getting sober and um use that as motivation to kind of push through uh get get some new stuff ready to play but um otherwise it's not really a part of my daily life anymore um which you know uh i i'm doing quite well but there are certainly things that are still missing from my life. And I can kind of bunch those into um, three categories in uh, creative outlet, companionship and financial stability. Um, And so, but like, it's, I'm not in a rush, you know, Um, those are all great things to be working on. Sure. One step in front of the other. Pretty normal, I think. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, it is the human condition after all. Right. (laughs) I I used to get really frustrated about it um, in, particularly in like earlier sobriety. I, I think where I'm at right now, it'd still be considered pretty early sobriety. But um, in those first six months a year, I was like, man, here's this missing piece that I used to use to kind of define myself. Um, like my, my entire ego had been built around the fact that people were playing to paying to fly me around to play at festivals and stuff. And um, having that kind of taken away, uh, I was certainly a gut punch. Um, whereas today, I don't know, it's, it's all so much more organic, uh, like this sense of well being, um, which has been really nice. And, um, particularly, uh, it's, it has not been easy for me to dive back in, um, because my entirely, my entire creative process was, uh, based on abusing drugs and, um, pushing myself into a, a mental capacity where I could, um, sit down and tweak out for 12 hours at a time. And I just can't do that anymore. Um, so I'm going to have to kind of relearn my process, uh, which is going to take a lot of time and patience. And, um, I haven't given myself the time yet. Do you think you, is there a possibility that part of you, your subconscious is punishing you for what you've done? No, (laughs) (laughs) that's good. Yeah, no, that's. I love that you can say that equivocally. Yeah, that's or unequivocally. There there you go. Um, I it's (laughs) uh just kind of more like uh I'd become so used to um doing it one way, uh doing it a different way uh is pretty daunting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You basically have to relearn how to walk. Right. Well, dude, I love it. Is there uh anything else we want to touch on? I like, I like getting that the people, <laughs> you know, she <laughs> listens to this, right? <laughs> Hi Judy. Love you. Uh, you want socials, website, and that stuff? I mean, obviously you no. know, yeah. you're like, no, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't need to hear from you. Find me if you can. <laughs> That's yeah. I, I, if you care to hear some, uh, 
kind of dark and aggressive uh, electronic music made with a Game Boy Advance called Boa Constructor. Ooh, no, can, no space. Uh, can when we when we release this, can we put like a little clip at the beginning, a little bit of your music or something to open it up? Sure. Okay. Oh, nice. All right. Well, peace, love, all that good shit, people. Oh wait. Ooh. What? What's the thing? Peace, love, and Michael Bradley. <laughs> oh yes. So that's where we are. <laughs> Have it come around full circle. Peace, yeah. love, and Michael Bradley. And it's not a scary thing anymore either. <laughs> right. Hallelujah. Well, thank you for being here, sir. And uh, let's go get those arms taken care of. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>